been I've been working with him off and on for almost a decade now, and I've known him, I've known of him for 30 plus years. I knew him on campus when I was in IIT Delhi in the 80s as the only male faculty member to carry his child around on one of those basket things all around campus. Right? None of the other male faculty members would even acknowledge they have children. Dinesh graduated from IIT Bombay in 67, one of the third or fourth, fourth or fifth batch, fourth or fifth batch of IIT Bombay. Then he, he graduated in mechanical engineering, he did his doctoral work in biomechanics, from eventually from uh, University Anna. of Anna. 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 I always say Anna, the University of Michigan, Anna. Then he worked first as in DC with the National Highway. No, in short, Institute for Highway Safety. Institute for Highway Safety. <coughs> and then he came back to India and he's been teaching at IIT Delhi. He taught there for 30 plus years. He retired some seven years ago, but he refuses to leave his office and no one has the guts to throw him out. So he's still at IIT Delhi. He's already professor now. Most of his work for the past couple of decades has been in transport safety in all its ramifications, everything from in impact injury to transport planning to road safety. <coughs> Thanks very much. And I must thank uh, Girish and Joydeep for getting me over here. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's not many of us. Like you don't get to Delhi, we don't get to Sunipat. Uh, but though we are allowed to, uh, what I'll do is, is difficult for people like me to talk to people with a completely different background and different interests. So what I've done is I'll ramble on about cities and traffic and various issues, so hoping that some of it may interest you. Uh, what you read in the newspapers every day, especially after New York, New York Times journalist about four years ago wrote how horrible Delhi was and his wife would cry coming to Delhi from New York. So I wrote an article saying that I have a cook from Garhwal and his wife lives in Garhwal but she visits him now and then and she cries when he leaves Delhi to go to Garhwal. So it's a luxury for people to say that Delhi is polluted. And they tell lies that it's one of the most polluted cities in India. Because there must be 200 cities or 500 cities, especially small ones, which are more polluted than Delhi. But people in Delhi, including the High Court, Supreme Court, the National Green Tribunal, and our judges, and our politicians, and our professionals, they don't care about other people. They only worry about people in Delhi. And that's a very serious problem socially. Because then you make enemies of everyone else in the country. So then they say that people in Punjab are burning their crops. If I, if I was a, just be careful, you fall out of the window. Uh, uh, if I was a Punjabi farmer, I would burn more fields. And so why should I care that someone in Delhi is getting polluted because I'm getting polluted more when I burn my field? It's common sense that if you're burning your field, your pollution in your home will be much more. But everyone talks about pollution in Delhi, so that's a wrong way to solve problems. And these kind of, are the kind of pictures which get published all over the world about Delhi. The fact is that most developing country cities all over the world, except those which are close to the ocean, are polluted. And the people who produce the maximum pollution in Western Europe and the US, the cities are not polluted. So you have to think about that. That why is it that we are polluted? And what are the reasons? And why is it that very rich people in Western countries which, who consume much more, have many more cars, have many more factories, why are they less polluted? So I'll leave it there, because otherwise I'll go off track. And um, 
there's something happening between my computer and the screen. So C has been left out. So this is road traffic. And what does road traffic do? One thing it does is has actually have accidents. So people get hurt and die. So that's a health problem. It produces pollution. And so people get sick and some die. It causes noise and vibration. And so I don't know how many of you know that people, we, have, we don't have studies from India, but studies especially from Europe and the US show that children and old people who live on wide roads with more traffic have serious problem, health problems because there's more noise, more pollution, so especially old people and young children get less sleep. And any of you who've done a little bit of work on ergonomics or whatever, you know that when you have more noise, your heart rate goes up. Your heart rate just went up. See? So you, all noise, any noise raises your heart rate. And if your heart rate is high, a lot of the time, it causes problems with your kidneys and livers and so on. So noise is a serious problem. And vibration, because uh, here you won't feel it so much, but if you live on a big road anywhere in India, and when some truck goes by, you can feel it. So th there are problems, those are health problems, which we don't, still don't worry about too much. For example, horns. The noise from the street, everyone blowing their horn, makes people sleep less also. So my neighbor, I live on a road which is small street, which is so my house at the end, away from the main road. But after some time, the people who have their house on the lane just next to the ring road, they said they were leaving, and we, I didn't meet them for six, seven years. And I met them after six, seven years. So that lady was talking to me. She said, I said, why did you move out? You had a very nice house. She said, uh, we had started fighting. And ever since we moved, we have stopped fighting, that the husband and wife. So what's the connection? Why were they fighting, living next to the ring road? True. More than that, because they couldn't go to sleep early enough, so were they drinking more, sitting in the living room and watching TV. And so every now and then they would get drunk and fight more. So when they shifted, went to a quieter place, they drank less and fought less. So some divorces could be because of traffic. Just think about that. You know, you have to, th you have to connect a lot of things. Because if you just work in your own narrow area, you don't understand many things. So it's good to talk to people in other departments to understand things. It's taken me a long time to understand this. In the first 20, 25 years of my career, I didn't know any of this, because you don't talk to anyone. When you get older, then many people don't like you. So you're forced to talk to other people. And then you learn other things. Uh, congestion. Everyone talks about congestion. But congestion is not uh, a serious, as serious a problem as people think. Which places are, of course, in India we create congestion by bad road design. For example, if you come from Delhi to Sonipat on the highway, especially lots eight kilometers between, on the main road between here, uh, it's all congested, why? Because uh, road goes like this, it widens to 10 lanes and becomes three lanes and 10 lanes and three lanes. So if you have 10 lanes, it's like what a water pipe. Do you make a pipe which is like a bubble? A pipe is, water pipe is straight. It has the same diameter all the way through. But suppose every now and then there was a bubble in the pipe, it'll cause serious turbulence. If you, anyone who knows a little bit of uh, 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 fluid flow. So what happens is when you, the road widens, the motorcycles, the three-wheelers, the cars, they fill up the space. Then they have to merge again. That slows everyone down and the traffic backs up. So the traffic on your, on your highway, the congestion is not because there are too many vehicles, but because the engineers don't know what they're doing. They just, there is no bheja. And that's a serious problem in the wrong place I'm talking because most of those engineers have been taught in private bad colleges. So they don't learn anything there, and they pay a lot of fees, 
and they, when they pass out, they haven't learned anything. Then they join PWD and National Highway Authority because people from IIT don't join them. So they have no bheja. I mean, sorry, they have a bheja, but it's not been trained. And it's a serious problem because you spend so much money. So if you're an honest son or daughter, what should you do after graduating? You become very corrupt because you have to earn a lot of money to return the money to your parents. So just think about that. I raise it here because maybe you don't have that problem, but those kind of people who go to capitation free colleges, so corruption is compulsory if you're honest because you have to help your brothers and sisters get educated, you have to pay back money that your parents have taken as a loan and so on. So as you, you all of you are much younger than me, so you have to solve these problems in the future that no one should be asked to pay fees. All education should be free. There's no, there's no country in the world, I can say that with confidence, which has done well in the last 100 years where all education was not free. It still is in the Europe, except the US. But even in the US, when I studied in the US, you could go to the best universities in the world paying almost nothing if you were state resident. And all schools are free. 94% of Americans, it's the most capitalist country, even today 94% of children go to high school which is completely free. Only 6% pay fees to go to school. So what's the advantage? Even if you have rich parents, if they don't have to pay your fees, then you can do what you feel like. So I'm digressing, but I think it's very important as you become policy makers, please make sure Ah, thank you. So now I'll carry on, but I think it's terribly important. Make sure that your children go to free educational institutions and force the governments to do that. Because even if you are very rich, your parents force you to do what they want if they have to spend money on you. But if, you don't have to, if they don't have to spend money, then you can do what you like, basket weaving, sports, music, anything. And so, if the best brains have to be used in a country, then young people should be able to do what they want and not what their parents want. It's a very, very basic principle. Otherwise, people do things which may or may not be interested in because of pressure of society and parents. So what does this do? All this, it reduces your lifespan. It, can I? I'll sit down. Yeah. So technically what it does is, this most people don't know in our part of the world, that wide roads cause social exclusion. So if you have a wi very wide road in a city, then you can't cross the road. So if you think of a circle and you live on one side of the road, then half the world is excluded from you. Since you can't cross the road as a child or as an older person easily, then your whole world is half. You can only do things on your side of the road. And so studies done years ago in the Europe and US show that children who live on very wide roads with a lot of traffic have half the friends as the, num or the people who live on small roads with less traffic because then they have a full circle to make friends. And as all of you know, you need to meet many people to find a good friend. They help you do, and also people who live on wide roads do less well in school than people who live on narrow, narrow roads, other things being equal. That's because if you have more friends, you learn more, you help each other, etc., etc. Then, of course, less sleep, higher blood pressure, school performance goes down, and of course, you're fatter. So people like me, and I won't mention others here, uh, who, who are always in cars, we have a serious problem of obesity. And what causes obesity is not a personal choice. As my friend, one second. Somebody just gone.
Ah, here it is. So this is a relationship done by Ian Roberts, who's a very well-known professor at the Lund School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's drawn a graph showing, showing petrol consumption per person in different countries and your body mass index on the y-axis. So it shows that countries which, which use more petrol per person have fatter people. It's a pretty good linear relationship. And so over here, among the rich countries, people who use more petrol, some of these countries are like Japan and others who are very congested, so they don't drive as much. So if you have malls, you're fatter. Because if you go to a supermarket to once in two weeks to buy your food, you buy food for two weeks in a big basket and bring it home. And you cannot calculate exactly, how, if you buy food every two days, or if the fellow comes in a tailor in front of your house and you buy vegetables and fruit, you buy it for two days. You know how much you consume every day or every two days. But when you buy food for two weeks, you don't know how much, so you always buy much more. And Ian Roberts in his book is called, I'll give, I think I've given Girish a copy, Energy Glut is very well researched in which he shows that supermarkets in the food aisles, they've got the world's best scientists producing odors which are slowly released in each aisle. So in the bread aisle, odors are released so you want to buy more bread. In the pickle things, you have nice pickle smells. In the fruit things, you have more strawberry smells and so on. So especially children, and very often, when people go to shop, they take their children with them because there's no one at home. And so children force you to buy more. And so there's so much food at home, and then we're taught not to waste home, so you eat much more than you do, than you need. So all countries which are car-based and supermarket-based have fatter people. And so this is a very good relationship. Now, I'll shift from that general issue of pollution which I started with, that how do you find out what is causing pollution? And the problem is, how do you calculate it? Because you should know how many vehicles are there to find out how much pollution is being produced. But the government of India does not know how many vehicles exist in this country. Did you know that? The government of Delhi does not know how many vehicles exist in Delhi. Why? Because we did a very stupid thing 30 years ago where when you buy a motorcycle, personal vehicle, when you buy a motorcycle or a car, you pay tax once. You do not pay registration tax every year, which every country in the world does. So when the Delhi government says that 50 lakh vehicles in Delhi, 50 lakh? Yeah, 50 lakhs, 5 million. Yeah, million. But how many families are there in Delhi? 20, 25 lakh, 20 lakh. So every family has two vehicles. So anyone with a little bit of bheja says this number can't be correct. How can the poorest country in the world have two vehicles per family? So we did a survey and we found out that 50% of vehicles don't exist. They are dead. For example, I have registration papers for seven cars of which five have been sent to the Kabari. But I'm not going to, because not comp I'm not paying tax on them, so I don't go back to the motor vehicles department to do, why should I waste my time unregistering it? And the Kabari does not give you any papers when he takes your vehicle away. So how do I prove I don't have it? So as far as the government of Delhi is concerned, I've got six, six cars, but I only have two. So the actual number of cars in Delhi and motorcycles in India is half the official number. But the government up to today has, the first person, first report which showed this was 15 years ago. And that was a government report. The, motor, the, the mo auto fuel policy report done by Dr. Mashelkar, who was chairman of the committee. He was director general of CSR, C, CS, uh, CSIR one of the most well-known scientists of India, he said it. We've repeated a slightly better study. We say the same thing, but government of India does not know what to do in spite of these reports, because if they say that 
the R number is not correct, then they have to remove some vehicles from the record. They don't know how to do that. So they refuse to accept any study. The National Green Tribunal Justice, who was former Justice of the Supreme Court of India, when we presented this data were presented in, in, in the National Green Tribunal, he says, where has this come from? So the Ministry of Transport said this, uh, this pr professor, from, uh, pro this come from an IIT report. You know what the justice said in court? Who's IIT? I have government numbers. So the point is that when people don't respect facts, when they don't respect scientific work, like our present government, you're in serious trouble. Because we don't respect facts, you can't have respect policies which can be respected. Similarly, we don't know the exact number of gensets, we don't know the exact number of bulldozers, we don't know the, don't know the exact number of uh, cooking sources, power plants we know, brick kilns we know. How many fires are there in which people are warming their hands or cooking around the city, we don't know. And road dust, is a so only point I'm making here is that if you try to calculate bottom up on what's happening, you cannot get a good estimate easily. There's only one group I know who can do it well, which is Sarad Gutikunda, who lives in Goa now, but he worked with us for a long time. And he, if you want to find out, that's the best source for information. It's called uh, what? Urban emissions. Urban emissions. Just Google urban emissions, and you'll get very good data. Actually, much more stuff there is now. Yes. <laughs> and now, the second method of understanding is a chemical analysis only of particulates. And what you do is, you collect particulates, it's a very expensive method. With foreign aid, five labs in India have got equipment to do it. And the equipment costs more than a crore. And because we don't know how to maintain it, because our universities can buy equipment with grants and foreign aid, but there's no money to maintain them. And they're very expensive equipment. So half those equipment don't work anymore. This will act very quickly. Will this collection equipment, this will, is only about 15 lakhs. This is analysis equipment. It's very, equip very expensive. And because you have to freeze the stuff, keep, uh, anyway, I won't go into detail. We don't have time. But this, now what you do is then you get the particulates, and then you have various ions, which you see on the left, different kinds of carbon ions, molecular markers, et cetera, et cetera, all the trace elements in the particle, particulates. And then from foreign studies, we know what is the signature of the combination of these 20 things, which comes from wood burning, which comes from coal, which comes from internal combustion engines and dust. And so you can make a, an estimate, but this is a very broad estimate. You can't say, you can say these are coming from all traffic, but you can't say how much from buses, how much from motorcycles, etc. But it's a more reliable estimate because I'm not counting anything on the ground. And so what do we find? That, so this is what I told you earlier, that, and we've done in, now we've done doing more cities, that motorcycles are 45% of the total official number, and cars are about 50% of the official number, and it stays about the same across cities. Then people say we have very old cars and motorcycles. Guess what? India, has the young, young, India and China have the youngest cars in the world. The average age of cars in India is 4.5 years. Average age of cars in Europe is 11 years. Average age of cars in the US is 8 years. Why? Because the sales are stable in the rich countries. They're not increasing. Whereas in India, they're increasing all the time. So if you understand a little bit of arithmetic, if sales are increasing all the time, then new cars will be more than old cars. The number of cars which are more than 15 years old in Delhi are 1%. More than 10 years old is 6%. But w guess what we do from the Supreme Court? We ban old cars to reduce pollution. This is your Real survey, we have done this at petrol pumps. You count all vehicles coming at a petrol pump and note their model year, and you get this distribution of, of uh, uh, age. So, as you can see, over 
11 to 15 years, 6%. Motorci so motorcycles live for approximately 10 years in India. And cars live for approximately 16, on an average, 16, 17 years. Guess what is, how long cars live in the US which they say they throw old stuff? No, average is same, 16 years. I have a car which is 36 years old, but uh, average is about seven. So it's the same. Why is it the same? How cars last or motorcycles last in different countries, except in countries which have serious problems. In Iraq, they'll be older. In Cuba, they'll be older. But countries which have open borders are, or which countries which are not forced to close, like North Korea, by sanctions, they have old cars and vehicles. But countries which have open borders, why do they not have older cars than Europe on an average? Because technology is the same. They have the same age that they last on an average. The only difference is in India, one car may have two owners in its life, the first owner and then the second owner. In the US, it may have five owners. First, the rich white fellow has it. Then the middle class rich white, middle class white person has it then students own them, then black people own them, then the poorest black people own them. So very old cars are owned by poor people, black people, Hispanics, and so on. Whereas here, middle class people own them. That's the only difference, because we are not so rich. Another source of pollution in all Indian cities, and this which should interest you, because you're going to work on urban planning, urban architect, et cetera, et cetera, is brick kilns. These are the brick kilns outside Delhi, around Delhi. And this is the same pattern in all cities of India. All cities of India have a large number of brick bhattas around. Why? And they'll remain there. Because we are, we are progressing. We are, people are building homes, offices, etc. So they're not going to go away. What, what is their influence? And when they produce small particulates, small particulates, the smaller the particulate, the higher it rises, the higher it rises, the further it can go with breeze. So according to Sarad, brick kilns contribute about 17% of particulates to Delhi. This is not going to go away because we are, we are for all Indian cities. So what is, our what is your responsibility? To find out how to make buildings with cleaner bricks or technology without increasing the price. Because if you increase the price, then ordinary people can't build homes. And they build homes themselves, they don't have expensive contractors building them. So, you can, so an expert can f come from London and can tell you what's a clean way of making bricks, but you can't do it here. Because you can't use those expensive bricks except Mr. Ambani. So it's your job to discuss with people that what you're going to do in architecture, how do you do the same thing using cleaner technology, which is not more expensive, and that's very difficult to do. It's easier to invent technology for a rocket because cost is not an issue. It's very difficult to be innovative when you design something inexpensive. And you need a lot of brains and a large number of brains to do that. So this is the contribution of various pollutants, the particulates, two wheelers, 8%. Guess what the newspapers say? That motorcycles are causing a lot of pollution. Why are they not causing? It should be common sense. They have a small engine. How can they cause a lot of pollution? And guess who, which country has the cleanest motorcycles in the world? Anyone know? Which country has the cleanest motorcycles as far as pollution is concerned? China. India. India. And, and Taiwan. Why? Because when we signed the WTO, that means all tech, we, we cannot keep out technology from India years ago. That's one of the times that industrial, industrialists did something good. They got so scared because Japan was making cheaper motorcycles than in India. So Mr. Bajaj and Mr. TVS and Mr. What's his name? Hero, etc. They got very worried that they'd lose sales to Chinese motorcycles. So they made an agreement with the government that very quickly, 
we'll make our emission norms very strict so Chinese motorcycles can't come in. And they were, within two years, two and a half years, all of them adopted the cleanest motorcycle engine in collaboration with the government so that with technical reason, you stop Chinese motorcycles. So that's the only time I know that the car industry has done something good in the world. And so Taiwan has also the cleanest motorcycles and we have the cleanest motorcycles. And we also did all kinds of things at the petrol pump. So when you, you're not old enough. Earlier when you went to the motorcycle to the petrol pump, they filled petrol, then they took a small can of oil and put it in the petrol. That, and people thought if you put more oil, it'll, the, the, the engine would be, running would be smoother. So that caused a lot of pollution. So within two years or three years, all our petrol pumps were changed in the country that the oil is automatically mixed with the petrol. And that's why the petrol <coughs> pump for motorcycles now is different from the petrol pump from cars. So we've done some really good stuff in the country when we, when we want to and using our brains. And, but we don't talk about it. We don't, we don't, have you heard anyone saying what a great job we've done? You know, we have to think about this. And this was done when? Before Mr. Modi. Does he say what? If, he says 50 years were wasted. So cleaning up the air was wasted. So, you know, these lies which are repeated make us less confident of our own skills. We must praise what we have done in this country when it has been done right. But if you criticize everything before you, you are led to believe that nothing has happened and you become more cynical. So, and I'll just focus more, sulfur dioxide has been reduced because we made laws removing sulfur dioxide from our fuel. So all fuel in India has low sulfur dioxide. And lastly, there's a serious problem about nitrogen oxide. Nitrogen oxides, how, how are nitrogen oxides produced? Where, where do you have nitrogen and oxygen? Yes? Where do you get nitrogen and oxygen in large amounts? Yes? Louder. Air. Air has 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. So if we heat air, when you, if you know, remember your school chemistry, when you heat anything, then chemical reactions take place faster. So when you heat air, nitrogen and oxygen combine. So when you cook in your home on an electric stove, in your kitchen, you produce nitrogen oxide. Okay, so when there's a car engine or motorcycle engine, because it burns at very high temperatures, it produces nitrogen oxide. So the higher the temperature of burning, so nitrogen oxide is not coming from the fuel. Diesel or petrol doesn't have nitrogen or oxygen. So it's when the fuel burns in your engine, because of high temperature, it produces nitrogen oxide. Guess what burns at a higher temperature? <laughs> Diesel and CNG. So CNG burns at a higher temperature than petrol. Yes. So what have we done in Delhi? We are producing more nitrogen oxide because of our policy. And your chief environmental agency and the government have got international awards for the biggest CNG fleet in the world. And they keep getting international awards. So none of them are willing to accept this. And nitrogen oxides have increased in Delhi. What does nitrogen oxide do when it goes up in the air? It combines with water vapor and produces nitric acid, which falls on your plants and you. Up in the air, it reacts. They're very chemical. I'm not a chemist, so I don't know the exact details, but I've been told that it produces more ozone. Thirdly, when you reduce particulate matter up, high up in the atmosphere, then it does not capture ozone. So if you have reduced particulate matter, you have more ozone. So the point, only point I'm trying to make is 
we should never have one silver bullet. So if there was a lot of black smoke in Delhi, good, we reduced it with, with, with CNG, but we should have calculated how many CNG buses, how many petrol buses, how many pe diesel buses will reduce all particles. Uh, 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 pollutants. And the reason I'm saying this is that our universities should be doing more work because that's where we live and work. We don't move. In the government, everyone gets transferred. We can't move because no one else will employ us. So we remain in our own universities like I've been at IIT for 35 years. I can't go anywhere. So no one will employ me. So all of us stay, faculty members stay in the same place for a long time so you can keep doing stuff and become better and better and better if you're honest. And what is the job of a faculty member at university, especially a government university? Because you've got a stable job, you can't get transferred. Not only you can't get transferred, you can't even be moved from one department to another. So you've got the best job in the world. So what's your job? Only duty of a faculty member is to tell the truth as you know it. Nothing else. You may be wrong, but you should be honestly saying what you know. Because no one can do anything to you. Mr. Modi can't do anything to me except have me killed. He can't get me fired from my job. I know that. I've lasted in IIT for 40 years, 35 years. So it's a fantastic job. The Prime Minister can't do anything to you. And that's why you must tell the truth and find out things. Because others, our people in the army can't tell the truth, people in big businesses can't tell the truth, people in government jobs can't tell the truth. That's why we have universities. That's your only job, to study and find out and challenge authority. Because you're the only person who has that capability without being bothered too much. Hope things change in the near future so that faculty members feel safer. But it is our only job. And that's how we find out such things. And so this is what we know. That transport produces in Delhi approximately 20%, 25%. I don't care how accurate these numbers are. It could be, seven, it may not be 17%, it could be 25%. But it's not 50%. So, so you can see that trans, in Delhi, transport and brick kilns seem to be producing industries. There's so many things, power plants, so many things produce pollution that one thing won't solve your problem. So all of us in different fields have different responsibilities to reduce pollution from, it's much easier in London because in London, particulate matter, 60% is produced by traffic. So if you improve traffic technology by 30%, you reduce 15, 20% pollution. Here, if your pollution from traffic is say 20%, and if I reduce by 30%, 20% of 30%, only 6%, you can't measure it. So we have to do a large number of things in all fields to reduce pollution. And a lot of work and innovation will have to be done so that after 10 years, it won't reduce next year. I don't care what Mr. Bloomberg says from New York, or the expert. Guess what the expert from London who came for the Terry conference and all the newspapers published it. The expert from London says, we must have public transport. Wow, 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 we didn't know that. <laughs> and all newspapers publish it. See the problem of being brown? <laughs> Just under, please understand this. Why should a British scientist statement saying, use more public transport, have electric vehicles, don't let farmers burn their crop? Very good. No one knew this in India. <laughs> so, it is our fault because we should say we are doing this work and keep saying it so that people have to listen to us. So the only point I want to make here is that we have to work on <coughs> every sector so that if every sector reduces 20%, total reduce by 20%. So our job is much more difficult than California or London or whatever. And that's why all of you have to, whatever you like to do, do it well. So, I, what I want you to point out is, this is Sarat's work, that if traffic produces 20% of pollution,
and Mr. Kejriwal's odd even policy, so you have 50%, suppose you say I'm going to reduce because 50% of vehicles by, by odd even, total effect is 2%. You understand the calculation here? 20% traffic, four wheelers produce 15%, half every day, so that comes to approximately 2%. So if, you, if it is perfect, you would reduce pollution by 2%. And you can't measure 2%. So how can Kejriwal say he was successful? So when people lie through their teeth, we should say you are lying. So because you, we say you are lying, he doesn't talk to us. Same, same issue. And each bus costs one and a half, two crores. So actually, during odd even, we did surveys on the road, traffic didn't reduce by 50%, reduced by 30%, number one. But two wheelers increased, three wheelers increased, buses increased. So my suspicion is, pollution may have increased a little bit in odd even. And they still talk about it. So that's where, you know, the serious, the serious problem here of us, not the politician. Because some of us will say it, but the other fellow in SPA or Central Road will feel jealous from IIT saying this, they'll say the opposite because they, they haven't done their homework. So who does the politician listen to? Because there's food among professionals, okay? So you have to have a large number of professionals who are reasonable. <laughs> so anyway, and this is, I want to specially mention this here, that studies show that the total amount of carbon dioxide produced in a city is proportionate to the road area in the city. Why? because roads always get filled. You widen a road, you have widened the highway outside coming to Sonipat, it's full. 30 years ago it was two lanes, it was full. So no matter what you do, roads everywhere in the world are always full. So the only way to control pollution, CO2 in a city is not, is to minimize road space. Okay. There is no other way. And what does Mr. Gadkari say? I'm making high-speed expressways across Delhi, Eastern Expressway, Western Expressway, pollution. Mr. Modi announces in Europe, now pollution will reduce. How? There are more vehicles now. They're traveling at higher speeds. If you travel above 60 kilometers an hour, pollution has to increase. Because the amount of fuel used is proportional to energy consumption. Simple. But it's school erection. Physics. See, when the pollution getting center is petrol from space, might have the issue not been related. Actually, I won't even talk about that because the pollution and control certificate just tell people pollution is important. Yeah. Because you're testing pollution at idling. It has nothing to do when the car is in motion. Yeah. But it just tells people, I, so I'm not opposing it too much, it tells people it's important. <laughs> that pollution is important and sets a public opinion that is important but it's useless as far as controlling pollution is concerned. So the point is, if you look at all our new colonies, and all, I believe all of you were going around in the last one month, all our new colonies from Dwarka to the Greater North have huge wide roads. The question of reducing pollution does not arise by your design. And if you have huge wide roads, with large institutions like IIT and other colonies and so on and so forth, you live inside, who will use public transport? Because you have to first go a long distance to the main road. And old people, you will not allow your children to cross the road because it's huge and wide. So what do you do in the evening if you come back to the opposite side of the road? So public transport use will not increase no matter how many buses you get. Do you know what is the present statistic? 10 years ago, the number of people transported by bus in a day in Delhi was 900. 
That means on an average, each bus carried 900 people a day. Today it's carrying 700. So the number of people using buses has in decreased. So if you get more buses, and it's not safe, especially for women, forget in the bus. Most young women find it unpleasant to walk on the road because there are Indian men around. So we have to change many things in society for pollution to decrease. Because no woman, if you can afford it, will use public transport. I don't care how many buses there are. Have you ever tried to walk on a footpath? I can't at night because I trip all the time. If you find footpaths. If you find footpaths. That's the question. So even the newest footpaths, because they do, again, this is for you. When you put interlocking tiles, what do you have to do before you put interlocking tiles? You have to prepare the surface underneath. You have to compact the earth, then you put sand, you compact the sand, you level it so that when you put interlocking tiles on top, they lock and they remain straight. What happens here within two months? With interlocking tiles, they become, some of them come out and so on and so forth. So there's complete waste of money. So it's really good for PWD because when they start coming out, they say up to so change current. So every two years, you put new tiles and people trip over them. So this is terribly important. And these are real studies. And I'll come back to this. Public transport. Does it save time? Why should people use public transport? I'll just give you real numbers. If you want to go three kilometers by metro, and I'm taking minimum numbers, you take five minutes to walk to the metro station, which is about the minute, least. Then it's, we have measured this, and the same in every country. By the time you get to the platform, you walk around inside is three minutes. And then you wait, wait two or three minutes, which is the pink part, wait two or three minutes for the train. You go three stations, which is three minutes. Then you walk around inside the station, then go five minutes to your destination. So that's taking you 26, 27 minutes for three kilometers. So what's your average speed? Six kilometers an hour. What does Mr. Sridharan, who invented the metro in India, say? It's the fastest way of traveling. Six kilometers or not? Door to door? It's, it's only this part which is fast. And it can't go above 25 kilometers an hour average because it will stop every 800 meters, one kilometer. So the maximum average speed of a metro can't be more than 25, 26 kilometers an hour. Okay. If you take, this don't exist in Delhi anymore, if you take a bus on a reserved lane, so it's, it's not bothered by other vehicles, so it's only buses, then same distance walking, but you don't walk around inside the bus stand, same everything else, bus goes slightly slower, but you don't walk around. So a bus in a bus lane on the surface is faster for a short distance because you don't have to spend time inside the station. So bus lanes are more efficient than the metro, door to door. Cars, if there's no congestion, if I take average speed of 15, 20 kilometers an hour, it takes only 10 minutes, same for a motorcycle. So only idiots will use public transport. Because for three kilometers, a motorcycle takes only less than half the metro. My home is three kilometers from IIT, three and a half. It cost me 18 rupees in the metro in the evening. My motorcycle would cost how much? Three rupees. Okay, petrol. So am I a complete fool to use public transport? I have to think about this. Same bicycle takes the same time for three kilometers as a metro. Walking takes little bit more, not much. So for three kilometers, walking all the way and taking the metro is the same. I won't spend too much time on this. At six, the car is still faster than walking. Sorry, for six kilometers, metro, bus, bicycle become the same. So up to six kilometers, the bicycle remains the most efficient as far as time is concerned. And, and pollution. 
It's only when you start going very long distances that the metro starts becoming, as you can see at the bottom left, the metro starts becoming, you know, there's a problem with the cursor. Yeah, now the metro becomes efficient. So it's not surprising in Delhi that most trips on the metro are more than 15 kilometers, 12 kilometers. Because people are not fools. So when the government says, we'll bring 10,000 more buses, five, are you going to use them? Because met buses are slower than metro. So there is no solution by saying, I'll buy more buses. Solution is to do your land, la land use planning, more nicer roads, narrower roads, lanes for buses, etc., etc., and no reserve communities, no IITs, no jindals, nothing. Because this is my IIT. If I want to go from here to there, I can't walk through. I have to instead of going half a kilometer, I go three kilometers. So walking is prohibited in all current urban planning. No colony allows people to walk through or bicycle through. Including, a, you can't be in New York City or Tokyo or London, or anywhere, there is no campus through which people can, ordinary people cannot go. Please remember that. They are not jails. Every can walk through London School of Economics, every can walk through Columbia, etc., etc. They are all public roads. Even when they are campuses, you were in Stanford or around Stanford, any, anyone can drive through. You know, you know what's it the most? De it, she's, it's a very good question you asked. It's the most. It's a very good question. What's the most dangerous place for women? What's the most dangerous place for women in every country of the world? Their home. More women are raped in their homes than outside. We have enough statistics. Just the latest. Huh? Yes. And the latest statistic from London shows that. Forget India. So security is not an issue. If there are more women walking, more people outside, and just look at lectures by what's her name at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Fatke. Just listen to a lecture. Just Google Fatke, Tata Institute of Social Sciences. She asked that the women should have a right to loiter. So now. No, I've done something else now. I've changed the graph. See, what I've done here is I've now produced congestion. So now cars are going much slower. Even then it's faster. So unless you have congestion, the metro is not an option. Metro, that's why you must have congestion for cars and motorcycles and bus lanes and metro, otherwise only fools will use public transport. So congestion, secondly, what places have congestion? Except by bad design, but normally if you have good design, which places are congested? Because congestion is a market signal that this place is good, otherwise people won't go there. So congestion shows you have a wonderful city. If there was no people there, there'd be no congestion. So people come to Delhi, go to Bombay because it's a good place to go to. So what you have to do is, and this I'm not talking as a, these are not my personal views. There is a good understanding scientifically that all cities should optimize traffic, whether you go by car or by metro or by motorcycle or by bus at the door to door speeds between 15 and 20 kilometers an hour. Because in the last 100 years, no city in the world has increased that speed. In New York City, you know what, or London, or Paris, you know what is the average speed of cars during Russia in the city? Between 10 and 15 kilometers an hour. Delhi is much faster. And we, because we are, we are such spoiled idiots of rich people. We think we have a right to drive through anywhere. You can't do that in London. You can't do that in New York. Uh, today, the average speeds are between 10 and 15 kilometers an hour for cars. 
So this is what our research in Europe has shown that no one saves time. The amount of time people spend all over the world traveling for, to work is the same, which is called everyone has a time budget. So, and some people don't like their wives or husbands, so they don't want to come home. So they spend a lot, lot of time in their cars or take a drink before going home or meet their friends before going home. So people don't save time. The richest people waste the most time because they have too much money and they have servants at home. Poor people have time shortage because they have to cook, they have to look after the family, etc., etc. So no one saves time. When you make transport fast, like the metro, then people shift out. So people have shifted from defense colony in Delhi to Gurgaon because they can buy a bigger house and there's a metro. So you buy a bigger house, then in the bigger house you have three cars, and you produce more electricity, etc. So when you give faster transport, total energy consumption goes up if you have fast public transport. These are the contradictory things we have learned in the last 30, 40 years. So what happens is that when people shift from slow from walking, cycling to fast transport, your speeds go up, and therefore you can live further away, and your walking trips go down, and that's why congestion increases. And when you have a car society, then you have malls and PBRs. So to do your normal things in life, you travel longer distances. There are air-conditioned places, using more concrete, more steel, so you produce more pollution. And guess what else happens? So our friend, the professor in Florida has done this work. Every time a new supermarket is built or a mall, number of deaths increase because there are more road accidents because people are spending more time on the road. And as Ian Roberts has shown, you become fatter. So malls, are the, malls and supermarkets are also the enemies of society. All of them are showing that neighborhood markets are really good because then you know the person who's selling your goods, they recognize you, they take, they're worried about you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, how many of you have heard of transit-oriented development? All city planners and architects are talking about it. Anyone know what is TOD? Have, it's not been discussed. Okay, yeah. Okay, transit-oriented development comes from the US from 1890 because trains were just being built and there were no cars, but people were not using trains. So they started the concept of transit-oriented development that people must live around stations and offices must be around stations to use public transport. But after the Second World War, everyone had a car in the US, a lot of people had cars in Europe, so TOD was forgotten. But Japan was very concentrated, and so all cities are connected by trains, so they kept talking about it. But it happened, they didn't have to plan it, it happened. But in the 1970s, suddenly, America started talking about TOD, that you must have high density living and offices, and you go from one high density to another through public transport. That's called transit-oriented development. And theoretically, it's correct that you must ha have high density, but in the most famous place in the US which has done TOD is Portland, Oregon. They go around the world giving lectures in developing <coughs> countries. That we have concentrated living in offices around stations. Guess what? What is density of USA, of Portland? 16 persons per hectare. Was it, what's it in Delhi? After TOD. Wild guess. Per hectare, how many people in Delhi? On more than 100. Do you want? It to be more dense, but our government has a TOD policy because white people have said it, and brown people copy it. 
Why do you want to increase your density? Already living, people are living in horrible density because they're not rich. Yes, so under TOD, what we are doing is we are giving increasing FARs along the metro where builders are making flats for rich people and throwing out poor people. So are those people going to go use public transport? So TOD is a policy which has been officially adopted by the government of India and government of Delhi so that ministers can make money, builders can make money and throw out poor people. What does that mean? The reason I'm talking about these things is all of you are, will be involved in some of this architecture. This is something that directly all of you have followed. So, in countries which have had dictatorships, like Brazil, Chile, worse dictatorships like Tehran, uh, uh, not worse, actually, Tehran was better, but South Africa under apartheid, what they did was throw out people outside the city because they couldn't do anything. So poor people live outside the city. So if you live outside the city, you have no jobs on one side. You only have jobs on the other side, which are long distance. So mother and father go away in the day, travel long distances, come back late at night, men find other girlfriends, women find other boyfriends, all marriages break up, there are no adults in, in, in the slums to look after the children who are growing up, especially boys. They, they form gangs and there's a huge crime problem <coughs> in all those cities. You must have heard how dangerous South Africa is or Brazil is, Chile, the murder rates and so on. We are very lucky because of corruption. And because our, what, what do you call the master plans have not succeeded very well because of elections and because of corruption, because of everything else, we have slums like chicken pox all over the city, which is the best thing to happen because what are the Western people saying now? You must have mixed use, mixed land use. So through corruption, we have mixed land use, man. And so what's really good now? Because just behind your home, there's a slum. They come and work in your home, go back three times in a day. Because they come and work in your home and they go back, come back, they work with you for a long time. There's a human relation. I'm not saying it's a nice, feudal thing, but nevertheless. Thank you.